Hi, today I'm going to talk about how you can calibrate an anisotropic viscoplastic material model quick and easy to experimental, experimental data like this. So I have uniaxial tension in two different directions. The red ones are in the machine direction and the green ones are in the transverse direction. And there are three different rates in each direction, slow, medium, and fast. So if you have data like this and you want to find a good material model that can handle all of this, today I will show you how you can do it. So to do that, I'm going to do it step by step from scratch. So I'm going to close this window and I'm going to use the experimental data that I already have here. So I'm just going to open this uh, one of these files. Here it is. It contains time, engineering strain, and then engineering stress. So I'm just going to copy these files to the clipboard by con uh, pressing Control C, start up a new window of M calibration, and I will arrange it so I can see all panels, and then I'm just going to paste it in, edit, paste. This takes the, the data that I had in the clipboard and paste it into the software, and here it is. By default, it creates uh, different colors for each of these. I'm going to change the graph a little bit first, and I'm going to assign these to be two different loading directions. So here it is. I have now assigned material orientations to these, and the software knows the strain rates because it just read in the, the raw data, which contains time, strain, and stress. Now the next step is to select the material model. I have the experimental data. Everything that we need to know about this material is now given. And uh, we'll see that the material is anisotropic, particularly at larger strains. And this, I didn't mention it, but this is a polyethylene film material, so thin polyethylene uh, material that is tested in two different orientations. I'm going to plot it as engineering stress, engineering strain. But before I do that, you can see that it, the true stress strain curve is almost increasing all the way, indicating that there really isn't much necking going on in this material. Um, it, it kind of just stretches out this way. So, we do have an anisotropic response. The initial slope of the curves is strain rate sensitive, but not strongly dependent on the direction. The yield stress seems to be a little bit uh, direction dependence, and then particularly the large strain response is direction dependent. So what material model can predict all of this? Um, I will select here, uh, in this case, uh, the polyumod T and V model. Uh, there are a lot of different material models you can select, but in order to capture the viscoplastic anisotropic response, the T and V model from the polyumod library is very attractive because it can be used in basically all finite element solvers that you're interested in. So uh, in this case, though, we need to set it up ourselves very specifically because uh, it's an anisotropic material, and we need to do it in a way that makes sense based on the experimental data. So I'm going to use two parallel networks. The first network will be uh, dictating the large strain response. So the large strain response is the kind of the equilibrium response, and that needs to be uh, anisotropic. So I'm going to pick an HDOB, so it's sulfur gas or organ and the Bergstrom version uh, of it that I developed. So that's the large strain response. Then for the flow response, we could use a power flow, but that's a little uh, simplistic perhaps there is a little bit, appears to be a little bit of anisotropic dependence of the yield stress. So I'm going to switch over to the Yo, the anisotropic power flow for this material model. So that's my structure. So I have two networks that hopefully will give us the response that we want here. So I'm selecting these. Now, when you're working with a, a anisotropic material model in M calibration, like I'm doing here, uh, the initial guess of the parameter is, uh, is usually not all that great at this point. So we need to manipulate these parameters just a little bit in order to better match the data before we start the calibration. So this is kind of perhaps the hardest part of this problem, and I'm going to walk it through it right now. So first we look at <coughs> the type of parameters we have here. First we have a yo hyperelastic model with, with anisotropic flow. And then at the bottom, we have the whole sap for gas or organ fiber large strain response. So we're going to look at, we start with them for, for now, we start at the parameters for the anisotropic hyperelastic response at large strains. And um, uh, well, first I'll, what I will do is I will pick the kappa, the bulk modulus values. I'm going to make them 400. I'll make this one four, 
400, I got it. Here we go, on this one, 400. So then I'm not gonna worry about kappa anymore. I'm gonna make it 400. And then we scroll down here. So large strain response, yeah, C1, C2, and C3 probably make a difference. They're probably important. Just to make sure it's it's a nice stable model, I'm gonna actually introduce a lower bound on C20 to be zero. You don't have to do that, but I, that just makes sure that this one is it's not going to dominate any effect uh, after yielding. So I make that zero here. And then we have the anisotropic behavior. We have stiffer now in the one direction, which is the MD. I define MD to be the one direction. And um, <clears throat> we have stiffness here, K1, 1, K1, 2, and K3. I'm going to make this one larger because I want fibers in the mall framework to be al aligned around the stiff direction. 100 is way too large, so I'm going to make it 0 0.1. I'm going to search for that. I don't want any stiffening effect in the in the transverse, the two transverse directions. But I do want a second order term potentially to be active here. So I allow K2, which is the sort of quadratic stiffening effect in the in that direction, to be allowed to be different. And then these are the directionalities of where the fibers are located. They're just in the X1, uh, Y1, and C1 direction. So these are good. The only parameters I want to search for is the fiber stiffnesses and then the, uh, the stiffnesses of the matrix material. So that's a good starting point potentially. Now, let's look at the small strain response, which is given by this uh, hyperelastic element. At small strains, we don't need to search. We shouldn't search for uh, these. We want to have a very simple hyperelastic model. So it's going to make these uh, like this. At small strains, this number should be much larger. This should be a similar to the Young's modulus of the material. So let's take a look roughly what it is. It's 100, let's zoom in a little bit more. So oh, maybe we can, well, let's zoom in a little bit more. So 100, it's a few hundred, 500 or something like that. So let's make this say 200. It's a pretty high stiffness in that direction. We will search for that anyway. We don't need to have a good guess. The next thing we need to think about here is that do we think the yield stress is anisotropic? The blue curves are in the transverse direction. They tend to be slightly higher, perhaps, than the, in the axial direction. There's a lot of strain rate dependence, and there's some scattering in the data. But I want to make sure the software can uh, adjust that if it needs to. So, But I, I want to distinguish between the transverse and the machine direction. So the, the way I will do that, I will say the transverse direction maybe is higher. So I'm going to search for this. That's the G parameter in this. A hill set. So F is the influencing the one direction, G the two direction, and H the three direction. And I'm going to make, in this case, um, without more information, we have to make some assumptions. I'm going to actually, in this case, I make this 11. I'm going to search for F and I'm going to search for H, but I'm going to make them to be equal. So I'm going to say that maybe this is slightly different than these two, but they, these are the same. I'm not going to search for L, M, and N. These are shear uh, resistance for plastic flow. We don't have any information on that. So the default values are better than to allow the software to manipulate these because we don't have data for it. So I want to adjust the parameters as little as possible from the initial state in order to capture that data. So this will allow me to set that a little bit. Tau hat is kind of the yield stress. 10 is roughly where it should be. MBEM is the strain rate dependence. That's a good guess for it. And then these parameters here are very useful in general. But in this case, we don't have unloading or cyclic response. So we're not going to search for them. So these are basically deactivated at this point. So that's the initial guess. I'm going to save this. I'm going to run it once. And then we'll see what it looks like. And we'll see that it looks kind of interesting. It stiffens way too much here. So let me see if I can reduce this one by uh, a little bit, and then get it in a more realistic range. OK, so that looks a little bit better. Do we have the anisotropic trends? Well, the red predicted curves here in dashed are a little bit higher than the blue. So that's good. Uh, the clearly is not optimized yet. But this is a, the trends are right. So I can now actually just let the software do the rest. So I'm going to start the calibration from this point. And then we just let it run. So I'm going to set it up by say run calibration. And I'm going to do this in two steps. In the case like this, where we have a material model that is relatively OK, but it's not that close to the real response, I often start with a slow, careful optimization using the simplex method. 
So I'm going to run it for a few minutes just using the simplex method to, to make sure that we stay close to these parameters that we set up. We're just going to tweak them a little bit from that point before we get into some more powerful optimization methods that can adjust the parameters more rapidly and converge more rapidly, but can also have the risk of running into a set of parameters that are not very good. Uh, so in this case, I will just start with small, small perturbations. So let's do that for a little bit and see how it goes. All right, so it has been running now for two minutes. At this point, we see that the error has gone down from 35% down to about 28%. So it's a pretty good, robust improvement. Um, but I'm getting a little impatient. I want to speed this up, the convergence a little bit. So I'm going to stop this calibration and switch the optimization method for us. So I'm clicking stop. And uh, it already saves it automatically because I, I set that to automatically save improvements as shown here. So starting it again, and then I'm going to switch over to the extensive automatic method. I just set the default settings here. And I'm just going to start this and let this run for a little bit and see what happens. So after about one minute, we can see that there was a very rapid reduction in the error down to less than about 8% using the leuvenberg macard method. So this particular optimization method was very effective there to bring the error down. And if we look at the predictions here in dashed lines, it looks pretty good. Uh, if we let this run longer, the error will go down more. Um, and uh, I would probably let it run for about 20 minutes more or something like that, just to make sure that we have the, the best possible uh, calibration. But for our demonstration here today, I just go, I'm going to actually stop this here. We see the error is down to 7.6%. It's pretty good uh, running in about four minutes of optimizations uh, as we have done here. Um, I would uh, simply stop it here and say this is the, the solution to our problem, our demonstration here. So, so what do we see? Well, let's hide the legend. We have uh, two groups of data, the blue and the red. There are uh, they are uh, two different directions, unaxial tension, the dashed lines or the predictions, the solid or the experimental. And it matches the data really well. We'll see that we have a very slight amount of, of uh, anisotropic yield uh, here, that we have the G parameters to be slightly larger than the F and H. Uh, we have this nice capturing of the large strain response simply by uh, these whole sapphire gas or Ogden type uh, hyperelastic parameters in the end. And this is rate dependent, it's anisotropic. You can apply it in your finite element simulations. Uh, to use it, the next step, of course, is always is to export it. These are the different formats. This particular model can be exported too. You can then use it in your finite element simulation. If you have any questions on any of these, uh, you can always ask them below. Thank you.